I'm very pleased to introduce this morning Brother Wayne Blake. Uh, Wayne and his wife Laura have a daughter Jenna, a little doll by the way. Married 15 years, uh, began preaching at the age 12. He leads singing and does all sorts of work for the church. He has been in full-time work for 12 years and preaching part-time for 26 years. You're not that old, are you? Well, if you started at 12, huh? Okay. He attended OCC and Fried Hardeman. We attended here at SBI for two years in preacher training. Uh, he has spoken on the spring lectures for three years, and he's done gospel meetings lots of places. He's currently at the Fish Hatchery Road in uh, Huntsville, Texas. And uh, I, I have to say this, I appreciate so much the support that he and his family have given us here in spring for years. This is, uh, I believe, what uh, what fellowship is all about in the church, one congregation to the other, and we treasure that fellowship that we have with uh, Fish Hatchery Road and his, uh, his dad, Weldon, and their family. Uh, without further ado, Wayne, come speak to us. Brother Mowry gave back about five, six minutes, so I'm going to take those. Wrong. Oh, all right. The elder has spoken. I do appreciate it and, and honor to be able to speak to you this morning. I'm going to speak to you about a subject that is near to dear to me, especially now that I have a four-year-old, and that's family. Brother, uh, buddy was talking about it's, it's the, the fellowship we have with one another. You know, that's easy to do when we're unified. We have unity. We're unified on the scriptures. And therefore, I can have that fellowship with him. This morning, we're going to talk about family. And primarily, at least uh, the first 45 minutes, we're going to talk about our blood relatives, that family. In other words, our moms, our dads, our cousins, uncles. And then about the last 15, we'll talk about our family, the family of God. It's sad. It's saddened to me. All of us have these types of families, in some sense or another. We have some of our family that is that family that don't have much to do with. When I was younger, I remember going to family reunions and only recognizing my cousins or my aunts or my uncle, but not recognizing who they were married to because this was their third or fourth or fifth or sixth one. And a whole new brand of kids. In other words, this is whoever they married already had their kids. Now you're going to enter their kids. In other words, that's the type of families a lot of us come from or we have. In other words, they're not godly people. Oh, they may be denominational in a sense. They say they're Christians, but they're the drinkers, the partiers the adulterers, and the list goes on. And then many of us are blessed because we have within that also, within that family, brothers and sisters, moms, dads, who are Christians. And we have a unity because they too are faithful Christians. And this morning, the topic is unity in the family. And I want to say, first of all, thank you for allowing me to speak to the elders, to David, and, and to you for showing here. I, I like the attendance in my audience compared to Michael's. I've got a lot more people here. They heard Michael was speaking, and they hit the road. The majority of our discussion, as I said, is going to be about our physical family. Unity, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but I want to give a simple definition because Paul did in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 10. He says that we are to speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together 
in the same mind and in the same judgment. Family, our blood relatives, if we are blessed to live in a Christian home, we have this type of unity. We can and must, if we are to be united in Christ, to have this type of unity. Jesus is our example in all things, of course, as a Christian. And he gave us a design and, and how that we are to be unified within that family. And this morning we're going to look at three situations involving Jesus in regards to his own personal family and his own admonition to us who may have members with our family. This morning we're not going to talk about our family obligations in the sense that if we have a mother or father who is not a Christian, what are my obligations as a Christian to them? We're not going to talk about those things. We're going to talk primarily this morning about striving to keep the unity within our families among Christians. There is no biblical example where we see the family must be joined together no matter what. And folks, we have as a nation, as a society, been sold a bill of goods regarding this idea. Because a lot of people today believe this. Well, you know, they're my family. I've got to take them as they are. And, 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 and how can you say I can't be with them? They're my family. How many of our brethren do we see that give in to this idea that, well, they're my family, therefore, I'm going to stay with them. I'm going to uphold them. I may not like everything they do, but they're still my family. How many of us are, uh, do we see that are running away from the faith because they choose their family over the church, or over God. We see that happening often. Jesus, our elder brother, teaches us through his examples of how we are to be. First of all, at the age of 12, Jesus is in the temple. <clears throat> his parents had now gone a day's journey from where he was, thinking that Jesus was in uh, with the group of people that they're traveling with, and they get a day's journey, and they realize, uh-oh, Jesus isn't here. So they come all the way back to Jerusalem to find him, and this is what he said to them. In Luke chapter 2, verse 46 and following, it says, And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, both hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when they saw him, they were amazed. And his mother said unto him, Son, why hast thou thus dealt with us? Behold, thy father and I have sought thee sorrowing. And he said to them, and listen to what he said to them. How is it that you sought me? Why are you looking for me? What, wist you not that I must be about my father's business? And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was subject unto them. But his mother kept all these sayings in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. Now, some would look at this and say, well, they acted just like a parent ought to. You know, I, I think about that. I've got a four-year-old. I'm going to tell you, if I was three days looking for her, I don't know if I'd kill her or hug her. Think about that. That, that had to have been horrific for them. But can you not also see the side that Jesus is saying? Mary, 
Miraculously, you had me. You've known me for 12 years, and you knew that there would be a day when I must do what I came here to do. Is there an example there for us? Not that we want to lose our children for three days looking for them. Not that we want to be upset about them. But the idea here is, is that Jesus is simply saying, I came here for a specific reason. Why are you concerned about where I'm at, what I'm doing? Jesus reminds his parents, he is not there to do their will. He's there to do God's. Secondly, later in Jesus' life, his own mother and his brothers come. And he again is, reminds them of what's truly important. You see, Mary didn't learn the first time. Now she's coming and pressing, trying to, to get an audience with Jesus to speak to him along with his brothers. And he says in Matthew 12, verse 48 and following, he says, while he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak to him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. Well, you would think he'd drop everything and say, Well, here they are. Good. Bring them on in. Well, what did Jesus tell them? He says, But he answered and said unto them, and told him, who is my mother? Oh, Jesus, what do you mean? You don't remember that Mary is your mother? No. He knows who Mary is. He's making a point. He stretched forth, who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. It says, for, what, for whosoever shall do the will of my Father which is in heaven, the same is my mother and sister and brother. Again, he points out, I must be about my Father's business. I can't be concerned with all the things that come with being a part of a family. Particularly, they just want to talk to me. I've got work to do. So I would say, well, you know, that's, that seems a lot of really disrespectful. Did Jesus really love his mother? Oh, yes, he did. What did he say when he was on the cross regarding his mother when he spoke to John? He basically gave his, her care to John. Take care of my mother. Jesus loved his mother. But there was a bigger picture, a bigger point that Jesus was making. Jesus continued to go on and remind all of us of the place that our family must have. Unity must be adhered to in regards to the Word of God. In Matthew chapter 12, verse 25, it says, And Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself cannot stand. We're talking about unity in the family. You know, there are a lot of people out here in the world, they don't have unity in their home, they have union. And there is a difference. Because going back to what Paul said regarding the types of unity that we are to have among brethren, they don't have that type of unity. They're not of the same mind. They're not of the same judgment. And they may even be Christians, members of the Lord's church. But they don't have that unity. And Jesus said, if there's no unity there, that house will be brought to desolation. He goes on to say, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 34 and following, it says, I think not that I am come to send peace on earth. 
I come not to send peace, but a sword. For I am come to set at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. And a man's foe shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. God never expected our families to be unified. If we can be, so be it. But Jesus didn't come to unify our physical families. He came for all believers in Christ, for the soul. In Matthew 16, verse 24, it says, And then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall you lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? Family. Family is number two. God is number one. And any time that those numbers change, we're not unified regarding our fellowship and relationship to God. God, Jesus is not saying that we are forsake our family obligations. We're not to forsake our children our wives, our husbands. But they need to be in their right place. You know, there was a time, I remember growing up, this was never said verbatim, but this was taught to me verbatim. Don't make me, as a parent, choose between you and God. That wasn't a threat. That was just a statement of fact. Because there was no doubt in my mind that when Sunday morning rolled around, I was going to be in the car headed to worship. We knew that. And we were taught by example that God will come first in this home. And if that's not good enough for you, son or daughter, then you've got to find you another home. You know, it, it, it's time for us as a people to quit giving in to Oprah and Dr. Phil and whoever else you may be reading and listening to. Those folks have no desire, first of all, to do things God's way. And they have no willingness to do it God's way. And if our children or our parents or our brothers or our sisters want to live like the world, then we've got to give them up to the world. Do all that we can to bring them back. Do all that we can to restore that unity that we once had. But we've got to give them up. Because if I don't, I'm now losing unity with my brethren and with my God and placing my children, my family, over the church. And I will lose on the day of judgment regarding that decision. What's important to you today? You know, some by their own actions show us what's important. They may say something. They may, you know, put something in writing. But, boy, the way you really learn about somebody is watch what they do. What's really important to you? Well, some say, well, the church is important to me. But I know people right now 
that on a Sunday afternoon or even on a Sunday morning, sadly, their family will come into town and guess where they're at? They're not in the assembly. They're at home with that family. You see, they chose their family over God. Well, let's get a little bit more personal here. Let's apply some of these things. Look around us, brethren. How many of our once faithful brethren are now loyal to their family only? Think about that. We ask, what do you mean? How many once faithful elders have changed their stand on marriage, divorce, remarriage because their child, one of their daughters, many times it's a daughter, because that changes the daddy. But their sons or their daughter now in their second or third or fourth marriage. And they believe Baal now. They don't believe Jesus in Matthew 19. They chose their family. How many people love their family so much to a point of letting their sinful practices continue? Well, I don't want to say anything because, you know, we have a family reunion coming up in July, and I don't want to say anything because it might cause some problems. Some love their family so much to the point. You know, old brother so-and-so there down there, his wife, she's old drunk. We need to withdraw from her. But don't you dare touch my family. Don't you dare talk about withdrawing from my daughter or my son or my cousin or whoever. How many love their family so much and they support them despite the warnings of the faithful as well as Jesus' own words? Folks, we've got them all around us. I remember many a sermon. Growing up in my lifetime being amen. About needing to be able to stop fellowshipping those who will not repent. We need to make a stand. We need to cleanse the church. Do the right thing. But don't bother me about my family. Yeah, you get rid of the rest of them. But you leave me alone. Don't start teaching about my family, preacher. Now, you go over there, you talk about old so-and-so, but don't you talk about my family. I know they're not perfect, but I love them anyway. Is that really love? You know, we've been talking about love all the time, have we not? How the liberals define love. You go your way, I go my way, and we'll all make it to the same place. Yeah, they're going to make it to their same place, but it's not going to be heaven. A lot of people have that same mindset regarding their own physical family. We want to allow for those to withdraw fellowship of any. You know, the old Johnson family, you know, his husband ran off with his secretary. We've got to withdraw from him. You know, the Williams family, now, I'm using these as examples. If there are any of you here with these last names, I'm not talking about you. <laughs> so don't get upset. I'm using them. These are the first things popped in my mind. That old Williams family, his wife's a drunk. And we can't abide by that. We can't have her down there. You can smell that liquor on her breath when she's up there saying, How you doing? Nice to see you. What about the Roberts family? You know, he, she's a gossiper, and, and, you know, they got family members. They, they like to drink. We can't have that down here. But don't you dare mess with my daughter. She's in her second marriage, and she's happy, so you leave her alone. She may be living in adultery. Well, that's your definition. I say she's happy, and that's what I want for her. 
That's all I've ever wanted for her. Her whole life is to make her happy. She's happy. Leave her alone. You ever hear people like that? I have. I can't just let them go. What, what would I do if, if I stood up against them? What if my daughter decided she wouldn't have anything to do with me? Then, then I'd just lose her. Brother, you've already lost her. You may have her physically in this life, but that's as far as you're ever going to take it. Because she's already gone. She's living in adultery. She's already lost. We gotta hurry up. We got thirty-four more minutes. All right. Some of the faithful, and I say this with every ounce of love I can. There are faithful brethren who are listening. Maybe by the internet, they're gonna watch this tape. Maybe some in this audience this very morning. You're struggling. You're struggling with temptation. The temptation is to, but you're talking about my, my daughter, my son. You're talking about my mom, my father, my dad. What are you saying? You know, this is hard for me. Oh, there's no doubt. There's no doubt. Some today, their own fellowship practices where they have their favorite uncle or their favorite dad or their favorite grandfather, or grandmother, or aunt. They may be a preacher. They may be an elder. They're my family. How can I stand against them? My parents, I can't give them up. What about my son, my daughter? Why? Why are you telling me, Jesus? Why are you saying I've got to love them less? Why are you saying that I've got to give them up if they won't get out of their sin? Why? I, I love them. I want to be with them. We've heard sermons that have been taught for years. We need to discipline our brethren. Why are so will many not willing to... to to fellowship, to discipline. Well, some of them because of the personal congregational laws. Some will look at the congregation and say, well, you know, they're our best contributor. We can't lose them. We're going to have to, you know, we got to start cutting back. Well, you know, we all love them so much that we, we just don't want to see any harm come to them. Well, you know, it might divide the church. Our little congregation here, we can't take a division. And if you stand up against Brother X, well, you might divide the church. Folks, that church is already divided. That candlestick that Jesus talked about in, in Revelation chapter 2 and chapter 3 has already been removed. Because you're allowing sin and those who participate in it and practice it to remain in your fellowship. God's already cut them off from his fellowship. Not because he doesn't love them, but because they love their sin more than they love God. So what are we going to do? What's the first thing they do in a congregation when they got problems? Who's the first one out the door? It's not that sinner. No. Fire the preacher. That's what they do. We can't have him over here. He's stirring his stuff up. He, he's causing problems for us. What, 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 they've been here. They're one of the founding members here. They helped build this congregation. The building itself. We can't do that. So fire the preacher. He's expendable. Throw him, his wife, and his kids out on the street because we want peace here. We don't want anybody coming in here and telling us we need to withdraw or discipline these folks. 
Well, then they'll try to tug at your heartstrings. Well, you know, he's been an elder for so long. Just give the guy a break. He, he's been he's one of our oldest members here. You're trying to tell me you're ready to kick out a 78-year-old woman out of the congregation because she won't give up her sin? No, I'm trying to tell you that's what God's already done. But we must do it as a congregation. Folks, I don't like withdrawing from people. I don't like any part of it except when they repent and come back. That's the part I love. Well, I'm here to tell you today that there are some brethren, they're not about to withdraw from regular church members, and they're not about to, for any reason, to withdraw from any of their members of their families. They choose their family over God. What are they getting in exchange for their soul? The world. What are they giving? What are they giving up? You know, they want to be unified, but it's not unity. It's union at all costs. I want to narrow this down just a little bit more. It's a heart-rending thing when we're dealing with our physical families. The thought of having to, to cut them off, to withdraw from them, is sometimes too hard to bear, and it hurts. But Jesus said, he brought a sword. That's the example Jesus gave. We will and must at times divide our families. But we don't divide them because, well, I don't like the way your house looks or you got a better job than me. We divide because we cannot have unity if you remain in your sin. That uncle, that elder, that gospel preacher, that dad, that grandfather, that cousin, that aunt, that grandmother, at times we will and must choose between them and Jesus. What are you going to choose? What are you going to give in exchange for your soul? Well, this whole Dave Miller mess started. Not in the early 90s, but it was already known in our family. And if any of my family is listening, I hope that you will listen to what I'm about to say. When all that stuff kicked up, we knew about it. And it was decided then by some in our own family not to have Dave Miller in for anything because of his elder reaffirmation. Well, our family is a big family, not just big. They're big. I've got uncles. i got a grandfather who was living. He was an elder. My dad's an elder. I've got uncles, cousins, aunts who are husbands and wives to, you know, wives to gospel preachers, wives to elders, their wives to deacons. Folks, I've got a family that at one time we stood unified. Well, so you wonder why I want to get into that. Well, I just want to, very quickly, because I want to tell you, I'm not just up here preaching this for your benefit. It's affecting all of us.
But Dave Miller stood where he stood, and he caused a rift in the Lord's church that God's going to hold him accountable for if he doesn't repent, and all those that support him. But I've got family members that are members down southwest. I've got family members that are gospel preachers in other areas of this, and some of you know who my family is. I don't need to call their name. But this whole Dave Miller mess has divided my family. So much to the point where there's nobody left but me and my dad. Now, of course, his wife, my mom, my wife. It's divided it so much to the point where my own daughter can't have anything to do with her other little cousins. Not because of what the little cousins did, but because of what the parents are doing. Now, folks, this is real. And it's happening. And there are things that I am teaching my four-year-old that I never would have ever thought possible I'd have to deal with in my lifetime. And she's learning some things. And these are brethren that up until about four years ago, I would have laid my life down for them because they stood for the truth. And one thing about family, <laughs> when they pull their love and support from you, they are more vicious and more hateful than a lot of my own brethren who have fired me. And I have been fired by some of the best. Things they'll say. The evil, corrupt, ungodly, unchristlike things that they will say. Whereas four years ago, we were all on the same page. We were all on the same page. They chose their children over the church. And because of that choice, they chose, they by their own choice, made me make a choice. I'll serve God. And if that means that I have to never again have another cousin, an uncle, an aunt, or whoever in my family, in my house again, or in an in assembly of any local congregation again, then so be it. Because like Jesus said, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? You are. Thank you very much.